thankful for the scripture that was read, uh, Luke chapter 16 and verse number uh, 25. And now in your hearing, I would like to read Luke chapter 16, verses 22 and 23 and verse number 25. And the word of God reads as follows. Luke chapter 16, verses 22 and 23. And it came to pass that the day that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into, notice what it says, Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and sees Abraham afar off. And Lazarus, notice where Lazarus was. Lazarus in Abraham's uh, bosom. Then when we look at verse number 25, Abraham says to the rich man, Son, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. Our focus here. But now he... Lazarus is comforted, and you are tormented. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his holy and divine word. Here read in your hearing, uh, those of you who are familiar with this biblical account of two different men. One person was uh, rich, and the other one, Lazarus, was a, a, a beggar. And those of you who know the account realize that uh, Lazarus, uh, the, the beggar, he desired to eat the crumbs from the rich man's uh, table. And uh, he was in a bad uh, health condition, if you will, because the Bible recalls to you at night that the dogs lift his swords. And we realize that, uh, again, which we saw in this account, that the rich man, he went to uh, Hades, if you will. I was reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And uh, the beggar, Lazarus, he was in Abraham's bosom. That's where he ended up being. Uh, Abraham, at this point, being a figure of, of God in his love and his, his comfort, if you will. And as we uh, look at this account, it's not that the reason why the rich man was rich, that's not the reason why he went to Hades. And it wasn't just because the a poor person was poor that he was in Abraham's bosom. Again, a, a figure, if you will. But it was because if you look at the account, you'll realize that in that time period that they were living in, you'll realize that the reason why the rich man went to Hades is because he did not obey the law of God for that time period. And thus, the implication is that the a beggar, Lazarus, he did obey the law of God in that time period. But yet, that's not our focus this morning. As we look at this text, again it says, our focus is the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And then when we look at Luke chapter 6, 25, Within that verse, it says, now he is comforted. So thus, we are looking at the beggar and what happened to him. We're looking at his comfort, if you will. And thus, we see up on the top of the screen, the word comforted here is parakaleo. And we're looking at this uh, for a reason. And the reason why we're looking at this is because we want to know what that word parakoleo includes. 
Again, we see it includes a comfort. So thus, when we look at the uh, beggar, when we look at Lazarus, uh, one, he was in a poor health when he was on the earth. Yet, we realize that in heaven, when he gets to be comforted, his health is fine. And then, though he was uh, poor physically, we realize that when he is comforted, he is rich in every area of his existence. When he was suffering, there's no more suffering. When he was hungry, there's no more hunger. When there was sorrow in his life, there's no more sorrow, just bliss. So he's a comfort, if you will. So when we look at this word, parakaleo, this word, parakaleo, it's a twofold word. Para and kaleo. It means, para means from beside, near. Kaleo means to call. So thus, when we look at that word, parakaleo, it means to call near to one's side. Included is the concept of acceptance with encouragement. So what we want to notice that in the New Testament, it's to comfort others. And at times in the New Testament, it's to be comforted by others. So thus, again, that word parakaleo, it's at times to comfort so that one can comfort others. And at other times, it's so that a person can be comforted. Just stick with me for a few moments so that we can focus on where this message, this lesson is going. We want to look just for a few moments this morning. I know some of you are tired this morning. The power of calling someone to your side. The power of calling someone to your side. Power of Kaleo. We have the verb. We have the action. Then we have paraclesis. We have the noun. So thus, when we look at the verb, when we look at the noun, when we look at the verb, the words used for the verb include, we want to know what these words include, these definitions. One is beseech. Pleading, if you will. Another word is comfort. Another word is encourage. Another word, notice, another word there is exhort. Notice that word. Okay, when we look at the noun, if you will, the words include comforter. We know the Holy Spirit was a comfort. And we know who the greatest comfort was. Another word is consolation. When you look at that word parakaleo, you look at that word, and we mentioned it in a Bible class this morning. You'll find in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, that word, the verb, the noun, used about approximately, if you will, about 10 times in that one verse. And it talks about uh, God is blessed that he's the God of all comfort. And he comforts us that are in any trouble that we might be able to comfort those that are in any trouble with the comfort that he's comforted us with. We're looking at this word paracleo and this word paraclesis so that we can understand what it includes. Comforter, consolation, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, encouragement, exhortation. The word exhortation and exhort is being emphasized for a purpose. Notice when we get to Romans chapter 12 and verse number 6, and this is something that we've been looking at for the past few weeks so that you and I can continue to grow collectively so that we can accomplish the mission that God would have us to accomplish so that souls might be saved 
and that the body of Christ might be built up, might be encouraged, might be comforted, that we might grow in understanding one another and understanding that we're different and we have different gifts and so thus with everybody developing after discovering their gifts, we can work harmonious together to get the mission of God accomplished. Notice Romans 12 and verse number 6. Having then gifts deferred according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Again, we looked at 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 10 a few weeks ago. We looked at it this morning. And in 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 10, it mentions, as everyone has received a gift. So if you are a member of the body of Christ, you receive a gift. And then it says, even so, minister it, serve it. So you want to realize what your gift is. You want to develop your gift. And then God says, serve it to one another, being good stewards of the manifold grace of God. First Peter chapter 4 and verse number 10. Having then gifts deferred according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. Then when we go to Romans 12 and verse number 8, we're looking at this gift of exhortation. That's what we're looking at. Romans 12 and 8. He who exhorts in exhortation. So he that has the gift of confidence Comfort others with consolation. Those that have the gift is including encouragement. So those that have the gift of encouragement encourage somebody. The greatest comforter, the greatest encourager was Jesus. When we look at Mark chapter 1 and verse number 40, it states... Now, a leper came to uh, him. Now, if anybody is familiar with the disease of leprosy, it was a dreaded disease. When we look at uh, COVID, if you will, what does it have for leprosy? So when we look at, just, just think of the uh, what happened when uh, COVID was at its peak. Well, when you look at a, a person that had uh, leprosy at that time, they were rejected. They were ostracized from the uh, public, if you will. So if you were a leper, one of the things that that meant was you was not allowed to come into the worship assembly. So you couldn't worship. You remember when we had the COVID and we had to stay at home? Well, uh, this person that had leprosy, and what would happen is you would have uh, sores in your uh, skin. And uh, when you came into the public, everybody had to get away from you. And according to history, you had to, if you had leprosy, you wore certain clothing, if you will. And then when you walked through and the public was there, you had to put your hand over your mouth. And you had to say, unclean, unclean, for people to get away. And it's been reported that some people, they would even throw rocks at lepers. And then what would happen is because of the condition of your body, what would start, one of the things that would start happening was that you would start losing uh, feelings in your fingers and in your extremities, your toes and stuff. So one of the things that would happen is eventually what hap would happen was part parts of your body would start falling off. And then sometimes what you would do, because you didn't have feelings in your uh, fingers, if you will, you know, uh, when we are heating something and we uh, it burns, you draw your hand back, we'll see. You didn't draw your hand back if uh, you had leprosy because sometimes you had no feelings. So sometimes you would start burning your fingers and stuff off. And, and then eventually 
what would happen, and they were the outcasts of society. So the lepers were set apart, and there was, if you will, like leprosy colonies. So they were set apart from the, the masses, and they were ostracized, and they were rejected by society, and you were being paid also. And eventually, if you were not cured of leprosy, you would die. So thus, this man was in a dire, he was in a tragic situation, if you will. So this man came to uh, Jesus. He wasn't even supposed to come to Jesus. And then the Bible uses the word, notice it's highlighted, imploring him. That's that same word, parakaleo. So thus, yes, y'all can look it up. So yes. So what he's saying is Jesus, he's pleading with Jesus. He's saying, Jesus, come by my side and help me. Come by my side. I need some comfort for this tragic situation that I'm in. He's imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, he's constantly saying to him, if you're willing, if you want to, you can make me clean. Now, what's the implication? Make you don't want to, Jesus, but if you want to, I know that you have the power to make me clean. So he's begging Jesus to come by his side and help him. The lepers, he's imploring, he's beseeching, he's parakaleo in him. You know that's not popular. <laughs> Mark chapter 1, verse number 41. Then, now watch Jesus. Then Jesus now, anybody else, what would they have done? There were people that would throw rocks at lepers. There would be people, when they saw a leper coming, they would run away. Then Jesus moved with compassion. What does that let us know? Jesus was feeling what the leper was feeling. He felt his emotion. He felt his uh, sorrow. He felt his uh, tears. He felt his uh, pain, if you will. And here's a question. Uh, sometimes in our lives, we're going through sorrows. We're going through devastations. We're going through a pain. And we're going through a physical pain. We're going through emotional pain. And we're going through a stress. And sometimes we're asking ourselves, does anybody feel what I'm feeling? Does anybody see what I'm going through? Does anybody understand? Is anybody that will come by my side and give me some comfort? Is there anybody that will come by my side and encourage me while I'm discouraged? Well, Jesus, he stretched out his hand and touched him. And the word that God uses there for touch them, and again, you can look it up. It means he attached the man to himself. A leper. He attached him to himself. And he said, I'm willing. I want to. He said, be cleansed. And then in verse number 42, it says, as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. He received some comfort from the greatest comfort. The greatest comfort of Jesus, he died for our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting. The greatest encourager, Jesus, he rose again the third day. Again, remember, he's the greatest encourager. So thus, when I feel discouraged, thus, when I feel tired, thus, when I, when you feel a stress, thus, when you feel you can't take it anymore, thus, when you feel you doubt your salvation if you will you can 
Look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse number 18. You have hope. Because Jesus is applicable to him now. He says, I am not I was. He said, I am he who lives. Jesus is alive. Amen. I was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And have the keys of Hades and death. So thus, the question is, will you and I, when we call somebody to our side and help them, there are your, your brothers and sisters in Christ, some of them need some help. Brother Jenkins needs some help. In some form or fashion, we all need some help. And what we want to continue to remember is that the work of God is a congregational work. God has given every member of the body of Christ a gift. And he's commanded me, he's commanded you to serve it. It's for, now notice, the gift that God has given Brother Jenkins, it's not for Brother Jenkins, it's for you. It's for the body. So thus, that means I need to grow in serving with the giftedness that he's given me. I need to serve it to you. And in like manner, you need to discover, you need to develop, and you need to serve your giftedness, whatever it is, to your brothers and sisters in Christ. And as we continue to do that, what's going to happen is we're going to grow in being the self-healing body spiritually that God would have us to be. He wants souls to be saved and he wants the needs of the members of the body of Christ to be served. Take it care. Will you call someone to your side? The question is, do you want to be saved? In order to be saved, one has to hear about the life, death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Have to hear the word, Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 4. One has to believe it. Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith it's impossible to please God, for he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is the reward of them that diligently seeks him. One, one's mind must change. What we this while we're here. Repentance is for salvation and then re repentance is an ongoing thing. Changing your, your mind. Romans 12 22 be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. So what has to change is your mind has to change. Because your mind changing will produce a change in your actions. So I'm asking myself, Brother Jenkins, why do you find yourself at the same position every day? Saturday night. Why? Because your mind didn't change yet. Your mind didn't change yet. So you want to always uh, examine yourself. We see the time. You always want to examine yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 5. So you want to ask yourself some questions. So you want to ask yourself, how come I'm not as pumped up about the work of God that this other person is because your mind didn't change. See, when, you, when your mind changes, we're trying to help each other. This is about, remember, this is about us provoking one another to love and good works. Hebrews 10, 20.
24 and 25. So thus, when will I be as excited about saving souls? When will I grow in helping my brothers and sisters in Christ? When will I grow in coming to the assemblies and coming on the Bible classes? When will I grow in reading the word of God as I should, applying it to my life? memorizing it, meditating on it, praying about it, and studying on it. When will I grow in that? When your mind changes. So thus, what Brother Jenkins is striving to do is change your mind. So thus, the person is coming to Christ, their mind has to change from the thoughts, from everything that, that was taught that's contrary to the word of God and it has to be changed to what God teaches in his word. Then one has to confess, yes, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8.37. Then one needs to be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins and then receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38. You'll be added to the church of Christ, the church of that Jesus said he would build, Matthew 16, 18, and 19. The church of Christ that he purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and verse number 28. You'll be added to that church, Acts 2, 41 and 47. Your sins will be washed away, Acts chapter 22 and verse number 16. And then after being baptized, be faithful unto death. Yes, the journey doesn't start, stop. There, once we're baptized, we have to continue to be faithful. Revelation 2.10, Jesus promised, I'll give you a crown of life. And at this time, we send the